And welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker. Get your Bibles out and turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, as we're going verse by verse today through the book of John. We're going to be looking at chapter 13. Now, let me just start off by saying I have thoroughly enjoyed this study in the book of John, and I hope you have as well. A um, lot of stuff in this book, and we've been going through it pretty quickly. It's a historical book. It's a eyewitness account of a man who was there. And so a lot of it is just reading. But you've got to look at the details. And I've tried to show you how important it is to look up in the other three Gospels. Okay, They're called the Gospels, plural, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they all tell about the Gospel, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But they're all still Old Testament until Jesus actually dies in those books. So even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are in the New Testament section of the Bible, they are still relating events that are taking place during the Old Testament up until when Jesus actually dies in each one of those books. And so there's a lot of information in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And here in John, we're, what, over halfway through? There's 21 chapters, so that would be 10 and a half, would be half of that. So yeah, we're way past halfway. And now we're getting into what we call the Lord's Supper. And Jesus is seated here, and he's eating his supper with the disciples. From here, almost to the end of the book, is basically pretty much a 24-hour period or less, all about when Jesus dies on the cross and what he went through the night before and all of these things. So it's all coming together, and John talks about this sooner than the other books. So it's interesting. They give a lot more details, but John, he's kind of like to the point. Let's just talk about the most important things, right? The Lamb, he's dying for our sins, going to rise again, he's the resurrection, he is eternal life, things like that. Now the thing that strikes me the most about this book is the numbers. And we've already looked at how there's times when, when uh, John writes this many days and that many days, and we look at that, wow, that's that many thousand years before a resurrection. So pay careful attention to how many days and things like that. Well, let's pay careful attention also to the numbers. Here we are in John chapter 13. 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion. Okay, Nimrod was the 13th from Adam. So 13 is always an unlucky number, you know, unlucky number 13, you know, people, oh, it's a, well, it's more than just an unlucky number, it's a, in the Bible, it's the number of rebellion. And what's amazing to me is, here we see in chapter 13, a rebellion against Jesus, because we have a betrayal. And here we find Judas betraying Jesus Christ. So it's interesting that this chapter speaks of the betrayal. And the one who betrays him is Judas. Now, there's a lot of other amazing and cool things in this chapter I can't wait to get into because not only are numbers important, not only are words important, but sometimes letters are important. And I am King James only, bless God, because I have looked at the other versions of the Bible and I look at where they come from. They come from completely different texts than the King James. The King James comes from the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Texas Receptus. Both of those are the pure line of texts. New versions of the Bible come from the Alexandrian manuscripts, which are the corrupted texts that have been changed by whom? By the Gnostics. So I do not accept new versions of the Bible knowing that they come from the Nestle Allen, Westcott and Hort critical text from the Pontifical Bible Institute and the United Bible Societies, who have chosen to use the corrupt version of the Bible, the corrupt text, if you will, in Greek and Hebrew and even Aramaic. They want a Bible translated from the corrupt Catholic critical text. No, I don't want that, because that's full of errors and mistakes. Someone has changed those texts. Let's stick with the pure text, the King James Bible. And so the King James is the right Bible because it comes from the right text, but also the wording of the King James Bible is so amazing. It must have been God who used the King James translators to pen these words in English. Because you lose a lot when you get to new versions of the Bible. We're going to see that today. How certain word choices that they use cannot help but make you think, oh, well, this guy must be that guy over there. The, and I'll just give an example, the SOP. All right, we'll get to that here in a minute. So put that in the back of your head and, and when we get there, uh, maybe you'll be as, as amazed as I am. So John chapter 13, verse 1. 
This begins Christ's time alone with his disciples. So he spends a lot of time alone with his disciples here. And here they're all together, and they're all going to eat together. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Now this chapter begins with love, and it ends with love. That's kind of amazing. Because toward the end there, verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. And uh, look at verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. So, where's the love? If you're a Christian, you should love other people. Even if they don't agree with you 100%, you should still love them. And uh, Paul says, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? I love you, he says, and I don't want to be your enemy. But we've got to unite on doctrine. We've got to unite on the right Bible because new versions change things. I'm going to show you some places where they change things too. But it says that before the Feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And, and it says in verse 2, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, comma, I mean, so, so this is all one sentence, all the way down to verse 4, Jesus, well actually semicolon, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. And it says here, After that he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Alright, so we're going to get into all this here in a minute, but it's almost Passover. And supper is over, and the devil comes inside of, guess who? Judas Iscariot. So he's going to then tell us some more about that. And he's going to go back into, you know, what happens here at this supper. So they're finished eating, and so they're sitting there, and Jesus goes and washes their feet, and then he comes back. Then he's sitting at the table, and he's talking to them. And so it appears that they might be eating a little bit more after that. Because Jesus does something, he gives sop to someone. So let's get into this chapter and look at it, but... The thing that I find interesting is how Jesus washed their feet. Verse 4, He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. And after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. Why did he do that? Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. He's most likely a 33-year-old man he would have known that they were old enough to wash their own feet, probably. But this is an example. Remember, Jesus is always doing something or saying something about physical, but he's making an application spiritually. So Jesus is spiritually making an application here of, if you're a Christian, we're all equal, and we should serve one another. So Jesus is saying, this is how you do it. So there are several reasons why, perhaps, that Jesus washed the feet of the disciples. Number one, because a woman did it to him already in John chapter 12. You remember in John chapter 12, verse 2 through 8? John chapter 12 and verse 2, here comes um, the woman Mary, verse 3, who washed his feet and anointed his head and all these other things. So we already see that. Now, foot washing. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. What is foot washing? Well, that is not something that we do today. Thank goodness, because we have sneakers and boots. <laughs> but back then, all they wore were sandals. And they lived in the desert. And they're walking through the desert and getting dirt in their toes, and getting their dirt all over their feet, and they're sweating, and their feet got dirty very quickly, especially, um, you know, stirring up dust, and the, and the feet are dirty. So when a guy would come in and uh, sit down, usually he'd kick his shoes off, and his feet are all dirty. And oftentimes, someone would wash his feet, or he would wash his own feet. Today, we wear socks, and that absorbs a lot of the sweat. And today, we wear sneakers or boots or things like that. So our feet kind of keep clean, pretty much. Now, they still can stink if we sweat a lot. <laughs> Stinky feet. <laughs> Those don't smell good. So there's nothing wrong with washing your foot. 
But do you realize how stinky their feet must have been? Not only were their feet dirty, feet stink. Okay? Like they say, why does his feet stink? I mean, feet stink. We say stink down here in the south. The feet stink. They don't smell good. So when that woman washed Jesus' feet, she was showing her humility, basically. Well, when Jesus comes over and washes the feet of the disciples, he's showing humility. So why did he wash their feet? Well, we see a woman did it to him, so maybe he was thinking, well, I want to do to them something and show them my love because she showed me her love. How can I show my love to them? He loved them enough to put up with the stinky feet odor and wash their feet. Number two reason, perhaps, that Jesus washed their feet was Jesus was showing them how to serve one another. And we see this in verse 13. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. Jesus is saying, I am the Lord, I am the Messiah. Verse 14, If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. So here's an example. So this was an example that Jesus is giving, saying, Hey, love each other as brethren, and do things for one another, even if it's something as disgusting as cleaning somebody's stinking feet. <laughs> and God didn't say clean their armpits. Amen. Well, that'd be even worse. So Jesus is saying, hey, this is an example, and here's what it's all about. Serve one another. Don't think that you're better than them or they are better than you. Be humble and be willing to help somebody else. So that's most likely the reason, but... Could it also have been alluding to the gospel? Jesus had his feet washed by this woman. And remember what we read in the last chapter? Somebody spoke up, it was Judas, and said, What? No, no, don't use that spike nard, it's expensive and all this. And Jesus says, Hey, hey she's doing this for my burial. Hmm. So it's all about the burial of Jesus. And so his feet were being clean for the burial. Well, Jesus, who knows everything, knows he's about to die on the cross and rise again. And then he knows he's going to send these guys out to preach. And what are they to preach? They're preaching a gospel. Okay, gospel means good news. So they're supposed to go out and give the good news. So could the reason that Jesus washed the feet of these guys be that he knew they were going to go walk and go all over walking and preach the gospel? And he wanted them to have pretty feet. You say, that sounds a little weird. Well, it does, but let's turn over to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 10. Whew, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about this because it's all prophecy. Everything Jesus did in his ministry was fulfilled prophecy. Romans chapter 10 and verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So you've got to have a preacher to preach the gospel. That's the context, is the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Verse 15, And how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Those that are out preaching what God said to preach are supposed to have beautiful feet. <laughs> so, weird. What are they preaching? A gospel of the gospel. So, it has to do with pretty feet. Now, this is from Isaiah 52, 7. It's a quote from there, so just for fun, let's go to Isaiah 52, 7. But could it be that the reason Jesus is washing their feet is for all these reasons? To show love, to show them an example of serving, but also, hey, you might not get this now, but maybe you'll get it later. I'm washing your feet because those that preach the gospel, their feet are blessed. And I want you to know that's what I want you to do. Go preach the gospel. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publishes salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. So there you go. Now it sounds more like the kingdom gospel a little bit. But this chapter, chapter 22, has prophecy in it of Jesus Christ. And look at verse 14. As many were stonied at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Who is that? That's Jesus Christ. He was beaten bloody after this. 
so much that you could hardly recognize him when the Romans took him and beat him and crucified him. So there's Jesus in the passage. Now, I don't have time to read this whole chapter, but read that chapter and see if you can discern and find Jesus. Mentioned here, Behold, verse 13, My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Who would be the servant? Well, that would be Jesus. And so in this passage, it's about Jesus. So much of the Old Testament is written about Jesus. So we see foot washing. Now, foot washing is something we don't do nowadays, pretty much. <laughs> but it is something that Jesus did, something they did back then. So, back to John chapter 13. So, that, that's my question, is why did Jesus wash their feet? Well, because a woman showed love by doing that to Jesus. Jesus showed love by doing that to them. He was an example of how they should serve not only God, but each other. But it also sounds prophetic. Hey, your feet are going to be beautiful when you go out and preach. So I'm going to make sure you start off with clean feet because the feet are beautiful of those that preach the gospel. So John chapter 13, verse 5, After that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Well, there you go. They don't understand why he's doing it. Is that maybe because God revealed this to Paul later and he wrote the book of Romans and he says, How beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel? Was he thinking of the apostles and their feet being washed by Jesus because they were going to have um, a gospel of the kingdom to go out and preach? Now, Paul, God gave to him the gospel of salvation through grace through faith, which is the gospel of trust in what Jesus did. Remember the who versus what. I've talked about that before. If you don't know what I'm talking about, see my video on YouTube entitled The Who Versus What of Salvation. So they're going to be preaching the who gospel when they first start out. Then God gives the what gospel to Paul, and he begins to uh, preach that. And the, and the apostles, I believe, got on board with that. And they preached the blood as well, faith in the blood. So here is Peter, and he's feeling very uncomfortable. Verse 8, Peter said to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only. And he's like, well, then in that case, Lord, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Now, I'm going to get more into this. We'll back up, read a little bit more of this too. But I was in a church one time. Was I in Mexico or in Arizona? Somewhere down there close to Sonora. And uh, I was visiting a, a man who knew my dad and went to our Bible school, and he was a missionary, and he had some folks there in the church. And I was visiting there, and I was asked by these people to come to their house. So I went to their house, and I sat down on their couch, and then they all left the room. And I thought, well, this is awkward. They invite me over to their house, and I'm the only one sitting in the room. So I'm just sitting here waiting. And then he comes out with a towel over his shoulder and a bucket of water, and he puts it right down at my feet, and he says, now I'm going to need you to take your shoes off. <laughs> and I was like... And then the rest of the family came out, and I was like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing, huh? And he said, I'm going to wash your feet, brother. Take, take your shoes off. And I go, ah, I don't know. And, and he was very serious. And I said, I, what? And he goes, I'm just joking, brother. I said, shoo, I don't want somebody to smell my stinky feet and wash them, you know what I'm saying? But that's the closest I've ever come to being foot washed, <laughs> having my feet washed. And it was funny. It was really funny. But this isn't funny. This was something that they needed. Everybody needed to clean their feet before they went to bed. And I know about this as a missionary in Honduras. Well, you'd be out there in that hot weather, out in the boondocks. I was out in the mountains and out in the jungles. And the end of the day, my feet were swelling. My feet were sweaty. My feet hurt. And you'd have to take your shoes off in order to get into your sleeping bag. And your feet stink. And so I would want to wash my feet before I got into bed. And especially when you're on those adobe floors that are all dirty. And you go to bed and lay down and your feet are all dirty. And you'd, you'd want to wash your feet. So it's still something that many people do today. Nothing wrong with foot washing. But this is something the church doesn't do anymore. Isn't that interesting? Maybe they should. I don't know. It certainly is a humbling experience to be willing to bow down to someone and take their shoes off and clean their stinky, dirty feet. Not only for the person having it done to them, but for the person doing it. That, that's a very humbling experience. And uh, like I said, I've never done it to someone and never had it done to me. But this is what's taking place here. 
And as usual, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, don't seem to understand what, what he's doing. They saw a woman do that to Jesus, and I'm sure they're like, yeah, woman, do it. Come on, woman. I will never do that. That's a woman's work. You know, they probably, that's how, how they probably thought at the time, okay? And uh, she washed her feet, so they're like, hey, okay, man. And they're probably looking around, where's the woman who washed my feet? You know, Peter was married, the Bible says. I bet when Peter went home, his wife probably washed his feet for him because she loved him and cared about him. So it has to do with love. Maybe I should write the word love up here because that's what it's all about. How much do you love someone? Enough to wash their feet? Huh. Well, I love them, but I sure don't want to touch them. Well, okay, maybe it's good not to touch people, but I'm just saying, if you could show someone the ultimate love that you care them about them, that you care about them, would you love them enough to say, hey, I, I don't know what else to do to show you that I love you. Can I wash your feet? I mean, that kind of shows that you're willing to do whatever it takes to show that person you care. Something that, that humbling, you know. So, Jesus says this, and Peter, he's like, huh. Verse 6, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? He kind of felt like I felt that day when somebody was there wanting to wash my feet. He's like, well, what you doing? What are you doing this for? What is this? Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. You think maybe he remembered that verse? How beautiful are the feet of them which preach the gospel. You think that might have helped him to stir him up to remember, Hey, Jesus washed my feet, and the feet of those that preach the gospel are beautiful. I'm going to keep my feet beautiful for Jesus. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Peter said to him, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus. And uh, what a thing to say to Jesus. No, no. And then Jesus says, uh, Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> He's like, okay, Jesus, I want to have part with you. So if you have to do it, go ahead and do it. But go ahead and wash my hands too and my head. Because you know what Peter is thinking? Because I just want to be clean. He wanted to be clean outwardly. Outward, he wanted to be clean. This was an outward cleansing. What is salvation? Salvation is inward cleaning through the blood of Jesus. So here we go again. A spiritual application is, are you clean? Are you washed in the blood? Are you saved? Because in the future you're going to be cleansed. You're going to be sanctified. Sanctified means made holy or set apart or cleansed. So salvation today is inward. We're saved by faith and it cleanses our soul. But here's an example of a physical thing. Here I am cleaning your feet. And they're thinking of it only in the physical. When I think Jesus was probably putting out there kind of a spiritual message as well. As I'm cleansing you outwardly right now washing your feet when I die on the cross that's to cleanse you inwardly that's to pay for the sins of your soul so I can clean your soul from sin so I see a whole lot going on in this passage and I see Peter just like not even knowing what he's doing not even knowing what he's saying didn't even realize he's like I don't know why you're doing this Jesus but if you're gonna do it just just wash me all I just want to be clean Jesus I want you to be happy with me just cleanse me and Jesus is like Peter 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 Verse 10, Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. So they're outwardly clean, it's just their feet was the dirtiest part of them. But Jesus also says some added information, but you're all clean, but not all of you clean. There's someone here who is dirty. Who was the dirty one? The one who Jesus is saying is dirty was Judas. Well, he's probably already washed Judas' feet. So do you see the dual application here? Jesus is talking about the physical clean through the water that I'm washing right now. But there's someone here who's not clean. He's dirty inwardly. That's Judas. He's thinking something evil. And Jesus could read his thoughts because Judas wanted to get money for delivering up and betraying Jesus. So Jesus knew that. But they didn't always understand what Jesus was saying until after. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, you are not all clean. Now verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Now do you know what I did? I gave you an example. Did they know? They're probably still scratching their heads going, No idea why he did that. 
and he says we're clean, but someone that here isn't clean, but we're clean. But my hands and my head are not, I mean, what, what? And they're sitting there probably going, I don't know, I don't know. So a lot is going on here. So Jesus knew about old Judas, I'm sure. And he said he wasn't clean. What does John 6, 70 say? Well, he's already told us in John chapter 6 and verse 70 this. John 6, 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chose you twelve, and one of you is a devil? So Jesus answered and said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Who is the devil? Judas. So Jesus knew that Judas was a devil. Now, what does that mean? Was he literally a fallen angel? No, I don't think that was it. Was he a demon? No, I think he was a man. But he was probably possessed with a devil. So when Jesus said, hey, he's a devil, he's saying Judas has a devil in him. So Jesus ran with 12 men, and one of them was demon-possessed. Keep your friends close, keep your enemies even closer, I guess, is the idea. So this is Judas Iscariot that Jesus is talking about. Go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4. And Jesus allowed Judas Iscariot to run with them, knowing that ultimately Judas would betray him. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So Judas' name is Judas Iscariot. All right, I want you to see that. That name is Judas Iscariot. Iscariot, which means man of Kerioth. So we're going to look at that too here in a minute show you where he came from. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14, and it's quite revealing where he comes from. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went into the chief priest, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. So the whole time he's with Jesus, he's thinking, How can I sell this guy out? How can I betray him? How can I get money by delivering him to the people that want to kill him? And that's what he tried to do. Now, Iscariot means man of Kerioth. What is Kerioth? Where is Kerioth in the Bible? It's mentioned in the Bible four times. Joshua 15.25 and Jeremiah 48.24. Now, let's go ahead and go to Jeremiah 48. I'm not going to turn to every one of these, but Jeremiah chapter 48 and verse 41. It's also found in Amos 2.2. We're going to look over there as well. But in Jeremiah 48.41, we find an interesting thing. We find that this town of Kerioth is connected to Moab. And Moab and the Moabites were not good people. They were uh, devil worshippers. Yep, they worshipped a false god. I'm going to tell you the name of that false god here in a second. It's in the Bible. Jeremiah 48, 41. Jeremiah 48, 41 says, Kerioth is taken, and the strongholds are surprised, and the mighty men's hearts in Moab at that day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pangs, and Moab shall be destroyed. So Kerioth was a city that the Moabites lived in. So Kerioth had to do with Moab. So Moabites were there at one time. Amos chapter 2. So could this fellow, Mr. Judas, have had Moabite blood? Could he have come from the Moabites? If so, that would probably answer the question why he has a devil or a demon. Because he was coming from a group of people that most of their existence worshipped false gods. False gods in forms of idols, and behind every idol, I believe, is a demon. Amos chapter 2 and verse 2. Amos 2, 2, But I will send a fire upon Moab, and it shall devour the palaces of Kerioth, and Moab shall die with tumult and shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So here is Kerioth mentioned again. God said he's going to burn it. And it talks about the Moab. Bites, Moabites being there. Now, Genesis chapter 19, verse 36. Who are the Moabites? You've got to know this story as well. Genesis 19, 36. Lot. Old Lot was in Sodom. Hmm. Do you know that when they worship pagan gods, one of the ways they worship them is through sodomy? Satanism uses sodomy. Um, not Anton LaVey, but the other fella that called himself the beast, the wickedest man that ever lived. What was his name? Um... 
Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley believed in Satanism, and he taught that a way to gain power in Satanism is to sodomize innocent people, especially little innocent children. And he said you steal their life force through that. Where does that all come from? Ancient paganism. It's gross. It's disgusting. It's sad. It's literally pedophilia, but it's more than that. It's, it's raping little children. It's, oh, it's horrible. Who would want to do something so evil except Satan? And in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 36, Thus were both the daughters of Lot with child by their father. When Lot left Sodom because God destroyed Sodom because of a certain sin, Lot left, his wife turned around, turned into a pillar of salt, and Lot left and was with his two daughters, and they were so wicked and carnal and sinful and evil that they had sexual relations with their own father because they wanted children and he was the only man left. Verse 37, And the firstborn bare a son, and called his name Moab, the same as the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bare a son, and called his name Benami, the same as the father of Ammon unto this day. So, Ammonites, Moabites. If you read your Old Testament, guess who is always fighting with Israel? Well, the Amalekites too, and other Philistines. But these are those that are fighting against Israel, Moabites and Ammonites. So there's a lot to get into, but let's go to Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. This is why you need to know your Bible. So that when you read about someone, you can understand what their ancestry, our background, our descendants is from. And maybe that fills in a little a bit of the dots of maybe why they were the way they were. Numbers chapter 21 and verse 29. Numbers 21, 29. Woe to thee, Moab. Now, anytime the Bible says woe, W-O-E, it's always something bad. Woe to thee, Moab, thou art undone, O people of Chemosh. Hmm. They are people of Chemosh. Who is Chemosh or, or she Shemosh? Who is that? Well, I'm going to show you. O people of Shemosh, he hath given us sons and escaped and his daughters into captivity unto Sihon, king of the Amorites. Okay? Now, let's go to Judges. Judges 11 and verse 24. There's so much to get into in the Bible. You could never, ever learn the whole book in one lifetime. There's so much in this book. Judges chapter 11 and verse 24. Judges 11 and 24. Wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before thee, them will we possess. And now art thou any any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? So Chemosh is connected with Moab, and Chemosh is the god of Moab. So their false god is Chemosh. Who would that be? Well, most likely that would be Baal. Because if you know the story of Balak, well, he was a, uh, someone who uh, got in touch with those people, and they worshipped Baal. So Baal would be Satan. He's also known as Beelzebub. First uh, Kings chapter 11. So, if you are worshipping Chemosh, you are worshipping Satan. It's that simple. And this is the city that this guy came from. Could he have had a false god? He could have been a Jew, and he most likely was a Jew, but he was probably a Jew that already had a false god. And because he had this false god, he was following this false god instead of Jesus. But he recognized that Jesus might be the Messiah, the king, and so he was buttering up to him, thinking, man, if I can get in good with the new coming king, boy, I could get a position in his cabinet, and boy, I could probably get rich off of that. So he was wanting to use his position to get rich. Isn't that what uh, Balak wanted, was riches? This is the way of Balak, the sin of Balak, the greed of Balak? Uh, First um, Kings 11.7 says, then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So the Ammonites, Ammon, had their own god. So the, the god of Moab was Chemosh. The god of Ammon was, uh, the false god of theirs was Molech. Now undoubtedly you've heard of Molech. Molech was a false god that could take the form of many different things. Some had him as the form of a dog. 
others as a giant owl. And his statue was like this, with his arms out, and inside of him was a giant oven. And the way they would worship Molech is they would bring their babies and place them into the arms, and it was set up to where the arms would turn like this, and the baby would fall into the oven and die. They would burn their babies to this false god Molech. Have you ever heard of Bohemian Grove? Maybe you should. Maybe look up sometime Bohemian Grove in California because there's a giant owl statue that is a statue to commemorate Molech. Folks, these gods might be old, but the demons behind them still live, and there are people in this world that are still worshiping these false gods. Maybe under different names, but they're still the same ones. Uh, we're in uh, 1 Kings chapter 11. Look at verse 33. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the goddess of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my way. So they're giving other names of them. And the other name of this one was Milcom. Milcom. Almost sounds like Malcolm. <laughs> Interesting. But there was a false goddess, Ashtoreth. Ash, let me spell it right. Ashtoreth. 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 That would be the false woman, Ishtar. So there you are, Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz all over again. And it's being worshipped by this group of people. Go to Jeremiah 48. Do you get this kind of information in your local churches when you go on Sunday? I don't think they even study the Bible, I hate to say. It's kind of sad. So I want to uh, make sure we know what the Bible says. If you study your Bible, you see these things. Jeremiah 48, 7. Jeremiah 48, 7 says, For because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken, and Chamos shall go forth into captivity with his priests and his princes together. And the spoiler shall come upon every city, and no city shall escape. The valley also shall perish, and the plain shall be destroyed, as the Lord hath spoken. Give wings unto Moab, that it may flee and get away, for the cities thereof shall be desolate without any to dwell therein. Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. This is the place this guy came from. And he's doing the work of the Lord deceitfully. He's claiming to say, Master, following Jesus, and he's actually an evil man full of a devil. Or devils. 11. Moab hath been at ease from his youth, and he hath settled on his lees, and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither hath he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste remained in him, and his scent is not changed. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send unto him wanderers that shall cause him to wander, and shall empty his vessels and break their bottles. And Moab shall be ashamed of Chemosh, as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, their confidence. How say ye, we are mighty and strong men for the war? Moab is spoiled and gone up out of her cities, and his chosen men are gone down to the slaughter, saith the king, whose name is the Lord of hosts. The calamity of Moab is near to come, and his affliction hasteth fast. All ye that are about him bemoan him, and all ye that know his name shall say, How is the strong staff broken, and the beautiful rod? Go to verse 42. 42 to 44. Keroth is taken, and the strongholds are surprised, and the mighty men's hearts in Moab at that day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pangs. And Moab shall be destroyed from being a people, because he hath magnified himself against the Lord. Fear, and the pit, and the snare shall be upon thee, O inhabitant of Moab, saith the Lord. He that fleeth from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that getteth up out of the pit shall be taken in a snare. For I will bring upon it, even upon Moab, the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. Hmm. So there's a pit involved. Well, we're about to get into Judas, and what happens to Judas when he dies, and guess what? It says he went to his own place. He went to a pit. <laughs> so this all ties together, and it's pretty crazy. So go to uh, Matthew chapter 27. So could this be a reference of, of this guy? And could this Old Testament prophecy be about what's going to happen to Moab? And it did, and it was a desolate place. Why does the Bible tell us that this guy comes from here? Why is he Judas Iscariot? If ish, ishi, ish, is it ish? It is man in Hebrew, so Iscariot from Hebrew is man of Kariot. And Kariot is a place full of demonism, following false gods or worshiping of demons. And here's where this guy comes from. And the Bible says it's going to be destroyed and nobody's going to come from there. And yet here's where this guy comes from. So he's coming from a place that is evil, 
that worships devils. And then the Bible says, and they'll go to a pit. Well, Matthew chapter 27 and verse 5. What happens to Judas? Matthew 27 verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. <laughs> well, let's go to Acts chapter 1 now. And look what happens in Acts chapter 1 and verse 25. They tell about when that happened and what happened. Acts chapter 1 and verse 25, we read, That he may take part of, that, of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. To his own place. Remember, he was a devil. So the devil must have entered out of him and took him to his own place. And we read in the book of Revelation that there's an angel in a bottomless pit. Could that have been what was inside of him? So many questions, amen. But something is inhabiting this guy to make him do evil. Now we get into something interesting. So let's go back to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, in verse, uh, verse 10. Jesus said to them, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Okay, who was the one to betray him? Judas. Now after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. Judas calls him Master in Matthew 26. When he comes out to betray Jesus with all the Roman soldiers and the priests, he says what? Well, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. I can't wait to see I wrote down the note, but I didn't read what it says. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26 and verse uh, 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staffs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave him a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. That's called the kiss of death. The mafia does that to this day. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master! And kissed him. Wow. So you go back to John chapter 13. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. Did Jesus know that's what he was going to be called when Judas showed up? Verse 14. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. So it's an example of serving one another. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So Jesus, it looks like, is just saying we're all equal. You know, like the Constitution of the United States of America says, we should be all equal because they said we're endowed by these rights from our Creator. And uh, today, is everyone equal in the eyes of the law? Sadly, it seems like if you're of one party, you have more rights than a person of another party. It shouldn't be that way. We're all the same. No one's better than anyone else. We should all serve one another. That's what the Bible says. So, John chapter 17. I would read Matthew 10, 24, but I don't have time. But he says, the servant is not above the master. Now, verse 18 and we're not quite there yet, are we? We'll, we'll read a little bit more and get down to verse 18. But it says here, Verily, verily, verse 16, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. For if you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. So do you do these? Do you serve other Christians? You're happy when you know you did good to other Christians. Verse 18 is a quote. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. <laughs> lifted up his heel. Where is the heel? It's your foot. <laughs> so Jesus is washing the foot of the one who's about to betray him. How do you think that made him feel? Knowing, I'm about to turn Jesus in, and yet he goes and does something that nice. He washes my feet. Do you think he might have second-guessed himself as he left to go betray Jesus? Maybe I shouldn't do this. He's such a nice guy. But then again, 30 pieces of silver, but he's such a nice guy. You think he had that conflict, maybe? And it's funny that Jesus says, he's going to raise up his foot, his heel, against me. Now this is a quote 
from Psalms chapter 41 and verse 9. So let's go to Psalms 41, 9 and read that. Oh, there's so much fulfillment of Scripture in the book of John. It's always good to go back and read those Old Testament passages of that Scripture. Psalms chapter 41 and verse 9. Yea, mine own familiar friend. I didn't read the rest of it in Matthew, but when, when he betrayed Jesus, Jesus says, Hello, friend, <laughs> to, to Judas. My old friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Wow. So that's speaking of Judas. Isn't that amazing? So, here we go back to John chapter 13. I'd like to finish this chapter, but there's a lot to get into, so I'm going to try to hurry. Uh, John chapter 13. I speak not of you all, I, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Okay, I am he. But believe that I am, remember, tetragrammaton, that's how the Lord describes himself, I am that I am. Now verse 19, now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. So he just comes out with it, and he says, Look, one of you is going to betray me. And don't you know Judas probably went? Because he knew that he was the one. But he tried to play it off, and probably the devil in him was like, No, no, no calm, play calm, play calm. And, but Jesus knew. You ever know something about somebody, but you don't say anything? But they know that you know. Or maybe they don't know, but they think that you might know. And you have that kind of awkwardness because does he know or does he not know? <laughs> well, that's what's going on right there. Then the disciples looked on one another, doubting of whom he spake. They looked at each other going, who? One of us is going to betray Jesus? I don't know. Is it you? Is it, how about? It might be him. I mean, I wonder if they were pointing fingers or if they were just going, because they didn't want to be the one that betrayed Jesus. Now watch this, and I've told you before as we started this way, way back at the very beginning, that I believe there were a lot of times that John receives things from Jesus that others didn't hear. And I said that because of this passage, but also other places. So John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke in many ways because he gives us a lot of other details that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't. Why is that? I believe because he was so close to Jesus that Jesus would often just kind of go like this and whisper in his ear something. And those were many of the things that he remembered that the other disciples never heard. So he says, I need to write that in a book so people know what Jesus told me because we've got Jesus' words that they remember, but we need Jesus' words that I remember. So watch how this looks like this was a private conversation between Jesus and the author of this book, John. So the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, that would be the one who wrote this book, John. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So Peter calmly looks at him and goes, he's got, he's got to go, ask him, ask him who it is. Well, he answers, but they don't hear it, it sounds like. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. It sounds like this was said in such a way that nobody else heard it. So Jesus was kind of like, Ah, oh, the guy I give the sop to. And John was kind of like, Okay. Didn't say anything else. They were quiet. There's probably a little bit of a pause. And everybody's looking, you know, and then all of a sudden Jesus goes, Oh, here you go, Judas. Have, a, have some more. You look hungry. And Judas, it says, and after the sop. So it sounds like he took it. I went, okay. But then it says, Satan entered into him. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. So then he gets up and walks away. Now, if everyone at the table heard to him whom I give sop, Jesus would have tried to reach it, and they would have gone, not me, no, 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 no. So see how it sounds like this was private information given only to John? And that's why John is the only one that records it? 
a private conversation. And after the sop, Satan entered into him, then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, doest quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. So as soon as he received the sop, so he took it, he probably ate it. As soon as he took it, he got up and walked out. And they're all like, well, why, what? If, if that conversation had been to the whole table, they would have gone, up. Oh, he received the sop, so he's the one that's going to betray him. But they didn't understand. That shows me that had to be a private conversation with Jesus and John alone. Now, what was that Jesus gave him? Gave him a sop. That is an old English word. And people say, well, you see, Brother Breaker, hmm, King James Bible's too hard to read. It's old English. Not really. It's actually made the, the, the English language what it is today. It's true English. <laughs> and it's lasted for 400 plus years, and we can still read it and understand it. But people today say, well, we don't use sop. What's a sop? It's a little morsel or a piece of bread. And so I looked up new versions of the Bible, and they say a piece of bread. Why is the word sop so important? Well, because Judas Iscariot is called the son of perdition. And if you take each letter, it spells sop. <laughs> and only the King James Bible does that. New versions change it to piece of bread. So is, is he the P-O-B? <laughs> no. He's the sop. So that's amazing to me. So I don't look at these words as outdated. I say, hey, let's start using these words. And don't change the King James Bible because Judas is the son of perdition, the SOP. I just find that amazing, simply amazing. So let's look at a couple of verses on that about Judas being the son of perdition. John chapter 17 and verse 12. John 17, 12. Look what John 17, 12 says. John chapter 17 and verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, the one he gave the sop to, the SOP, <laughs> the son of perdition. Well, that's the initials SOP, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So I love the King James Bible. There's so many little things like this in the King James Bible that are only in the King James Bible. You lose them when you go to a new version like the NIV or the ESV, and they say, oh, piece of bread. No, sop. I mean, what did he do? Cut off a loaf of bread and throw it to him? Like a frisbee? Here you go. A sop is very, very descriptive. It's a small amount. Now, if you've ever had Mediterranean food, we had a place here in town called Taste of Jerusalem, and I went there a couple times just to get an idea of what it was like to eat as they ate in those days. And their bread is not a loaf of bread. Their bread is flat, and it's round. looks like a pizza crust, and it's usually cooked inside of a round oven. And so Jesus would have ripped off a little bit of that bread, and oftentimes they would have dipped that either in hummus or some other sort of baba ganoush maybe or some other thing, or uh, olive oil. And so Jesus ripped off a little bit of bread and went like this and said, here you go, Judas. And Jesus probably did that a lot. Jesus had great table manners. It sounds like he's thoughtful. He's caring about other people. He was a great man to follow because he cares. And yes, he cares. Oh, yes, he cares. Jesus cares. So, Judas is the son of perdition. Now, where do we hear of the son of perdition again? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, here we see the son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. And we read, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, comma, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. The Antichrist is given two names. The Antichrist is, like I said, two names. He's the man of sin. And then it says, comma, the son of perdition. What makes him the son of perdition? Well, when the devil enters into him. So Satan entered into him. When Satan entered into him, he was called the son of perdition. So the Antichrist is going to be a man in the future. And he's going to be incarnated, or he's going to be possessed. The devil is going to incarnate him 
And when the devil comes into him for the last three and a half years of tribulation, he's known as the son of perdition. So I find that very revealing. So that means that it could have possibly been that he could have been the Antichrist in his day. Because the prophecy of Daniel about the uh, 490 years or, or 70 weeks talks about someone in the midst and a covenant and things like that. So this is what we call the postponement theory. And that is that when Jesus showed up, he showed up and was completing the book of Daniel. And he showed up exactly when he was supposed to. And he could have, you could have counted this as three and a half years, and there could have been another three and a half years. And right here could have been the Millennial Kingdom. And for that to take place, then the Messiah would have had to die, come back to life, and then somehow the Antichrist would have had to take over. And there still had to have been that seven-year period of tribulation for the Jews. Maybe three and a half of earthly ministry. Maybe a full seven years here. Three and a half and three and a half. Maybe this would have been the seven-year tribulation. But guess what happens? The nation of Israel crucifies Jesus. They kill their Messiah. They don't accept the kingdom because he came back and offered them. So now our time chart looks like this. Here's the church age. Here's the rapture. Here is that final seven years. Here is Armageddon, and then here's the Millennial Kingdom. So that's what's called the postponement theory. The church age is the postponement. So the church age is a time in which God goes to deal with the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Then he takes them out of the rapture and then goes back to dealing with the Jews. Do you see that? I hope you do. So I don't see half of the tribulation already taking place. Now some people think that Jesus' earthly ministry was three and a half years here, and so they think the tribulation is only going to be three and a half years. <laughs> if that's the case, and this is the seven years, then, then the church age, 2,000 years, is in the middle of the seven years, then that means that everyone in the church age is going through the middle of the tribulation, and that we're in the tribulation right now. <laughs> it just was put on hold. I don't adhere to that. There are people out there today that teach... Um, that the future tribulation period is only three and a half years, and they teach three and a half years happen back here, three and a half years are yet to come. I don't understand that. I don't believe that. I don't see how that's even possible, because you have the man of sin and the son of perdition. And there has to be seven years total here, divided into three and a half and three and a half. So one way to know if someone is a true King James Bible believer is ask them, what do you believe about the tribulation? Do you believe it's after the rapture, seven years? Or do you believe it's after the rapture only three and a half years? And if they say, well, I only uh, think it's three and a half years, I think that's someone who is not teaching what the church has taught for many, many years, that the future seven-year tribulation is an entire seven years. And it's broken up in, in Second um, Thessalonians as the first three and a half years, the man of sin is ruling, and the last three and a half years, he's the son of perdition. Something happens in the middle. What happens in the middle? He dies. And that's when he comes back to life, and Satan is inside of him. Just as the devil entered into Judas, the devil will enter into who? The Antichrist in the future. Whew, we haven't even gotten through here yet, so we got a lot more to get into, so let's continue reading here. Verse 31, Therefore, so immediately he went out, verse 30, Judas went out to go betray Jesus, to go get the guards and all the soldiers and the priests to come and get him. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Well, no, not yet. The glorification takes place with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But in Jesus' mind, it was a done deal. All right, this is what leads to that. Everything, all the events are in place. Jesus sat back and go, Okay, now it's all going to happen. All right, all I have to do is sit here and wait. So in Jesus' mind, it's a done deal. And Jesus says, If God be glorified in him... God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give you. Now, here is something that's taking place. Uh, Jesus said unto him, what thou doest, do quickly. And so quickly, let's go look and see what happened. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14. I just want to show you quickly it tells us here what was going on at the table after Judas left, but what was Judas doing? Matthew 26, 
14. Well, I think we've read this already. Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priest, and he coveted with him for thirty pieces of silver. So yeah, we did read this. So let's go to Matthew 27 and verse 3. Matthew 27, 3 through 10. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. So this is after Jesus died. So he must have seen Jesus die on the cross and, and maybe the devil came out of him or something. He had a you know, second thought. He felt bad about it. He went and hung himself. But before he did, he took the 30 pieces back. And he says, I've sinned against the innocent blood. He saw the blood atonement of Christ for what it was. An innocent sacrifice of an innocent person. But then, after he threw that 30 pieces of silver, guess what happened? And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, that's Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver and the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed. Now let's look at that very quickly in the book of Zechariah. So you're seeing prophecy being fulfilled left and right. <laughs> so he does all this before to betray Jesus. Then he sees Jesus die on the cross, and then he comes afterwards, and he recants, and he repents, and he says, I'm sorry. He throws down the, uh, the money and goes out and hangs himself. After that, the chief priests go, well, we can't take that money back. Why, that's the price of blood. Why, we can't. What do we do? What do we do? Well, they're fulfilling prophecy because it says in Zechariah 11 and verse 12. Zechariah 11, 12. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. Okay, that's amazing. That's a prophecy right there, but it doesn't end. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. <laughs> so there you go. It, it's all uh, being fulfilled in the Bible. So now we pretty much can just go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. I got a little bit long, but let's go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. I have very little left, and I wanted to finish this whole chapter up today. So I apologize for going long, but look what it says here in verse 33. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. So now I say to you, where is he going? Jesus is going up to heaven after three days in the grave. Then he comes back down, then he goes back up to heaven. Verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, and that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. Okay, so if you're a Christian, and you hate another brother or sister in Christ, are you really of Jesus? Because the Bible commands to love one another. That's something we should do. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Which means, whither, where, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me uh, now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So Peter seems to always open his mouth and insert his foot and say things he doesn't know what he's saying. And here he says, Lord, I'll go wherever you're going. I'll die for you. And we find out in the rest of this book, three times he denied Jesus. Wow. And I don't have time to read those, but you can go to Matthew 26, 33 to 35, Mark 14, 29 to 31, and Luke 22, 31 to 34. And the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. So three times he denies the Lord, and then the cock crows. And that's the end of that chapter. So next time we'll start in chapter 14. I hope you got what I tried to show you. And I hope you saw just how important it is to have a King James Bible. Because it points to the sop, the son of perdition. And ties this thing in. How Judas is probably filled with the same spirit that will be filling the Antichrist. Because the Antichrist is also called the son of perdition. 
And I've always wondered, wonder if the Antichrist coming up might not have been born in a place called Karyos. I guess that would be modern day Jordan or someplace. I wonder if, uh, or maybe even farther down there, if the Antichrist isn't going to be some sort of Arabic descent person with some Jew in them. I wonder. Well, anyway, no time to get into that. But God bless you. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time in John chapter 14.